Man, oh man, today is going to be great. Some of my favorite numbers are on this list, and I cannot wait. It's the The Memphis Accelerate Show. Hello, everybody. The Memphis Accelerate coming at you live from Australia. Today, we're continuing numerology, the study of the numbers. And today, we got numbers 51 through 75. And yes, for all of you who are curious, I did check. Numbers are, in fact, an archetype. But before we get into that, I've got a surprise for y'all. You see, I've got this here didgeridoo, and I'ma play it just for you. Okay, this thing's clearly needing some major tuning. Tell you what, I'm going to get right to that. In the meantime, let's get the review started. So rounding up the corner, we've got number 51, Finisher the Strong Arm. An Earth Rock monster with 2600 attack and zero defense, requiring three level 3 monsters. And his effect, he cannot be destroyed in battle, and at the end of the damage step, you can detach a material to place a counter on him. And if he battles with three of these counters, you can destroy all the cards your opponent controls at the end of the battle phase. Now I'm a bit on the ropes with number 51. Now on the one hand, you got some nice battle immunity with a 2600 body, which isn't too bad. But the fact that he has no defense against card effects, which is how most players would get rid of a monster this big anyway, means that he's not likely to survive to pull off his effect. And while you could run plenty of protection cards like Dimension Guardian and the like to keep him alive for three of these turns, the fact that his nuke effect only works after the battle phase means you can't really capitalize it on that well. But you know, this guy reminds me of something from Nacho Libre, so I can't really hate him too much. Go ahead and make a fun deck around this thing in time for the Goki players when they finally ride the TCG. No, no, seriously, this is something that needs to happen, guys. Get on it. Arriving from the depths of the Earth is number 52, Diamond Crab King. Another Earth Rock monster, this time with zero attack and 3,000 defense. He needs two level fours, and his effect is that you can detach a material to make his attack and defense swap. These changes last until the end phase, and if this card attacks, it's changed to defense position at the end of the battle phase. Also, if he would be attacked and having no XC materials, he is changed to attack position at the end of the damage step, but you can only control one Diamond Crab King. So for all you youngins who don't know this, one of the earliest structure decks introduced into the TCG was a little thing called the Invincible Fortress, which introduced rock monsters as an arc or as a type of monster, not an archetype, get your facts together, Memphis, a type of monster that focused around having high defense and going into high offense with cards such as Shield and Sword and Inverse Universe, and Diamond Crab King is a great callback to that time. His effect perfectly synergizes with the whole concept of rock monsters, and he really is welcome in any deck based around rock monsters, you know? Whatever kind of rock-based deck you are making, you really can't do it without at least two copies of Diamond Crab King, though I would personally go with three, because he's just that cool. Now, if you'll all excuse me, I'm going to eat that crab right now. Come over here, you crustaceous bastard. I'm going to eat you. Number 53, Harder, sporting some very inappropriate typing errors, is a Dark Fiend with 100 attack and defense, requiring a 3 level 5 monsters. His effect being that once per turn, when he is targeted for an attack, he gains attack equal to the attacking monster's original attack until the end phase. If he'd be destroyed, you can detach material instead. And if he's destroyed by an effect while he has no materials, you can special summon number 92 Hard Earth Dragon from your extra deck and attaching number 53 as a material, this being treated as an exceed summon. So yeah, this is a solid defense sort of monster. His protection effect means he'll last at least a turn or two, depending on what if exactly kind of effects your opponent's going to use. But let's point out that cool summon effect. This is the first number we've looked at that straight up summons a different number after he's been removed. It's kind of like number 21, but a little different. The only real problem with number 53 is that his effect to summon out number 92 only works if he's controlled by a card effect. I Meaning if your opponent's got one big monster, one very little monster, 
They'll just attack with the little monster, number 53, go by a few points, and then the big monster runs them over, you get nothing. So make sure you run, if you're going to run this guy, make sure you got some battle protection for him. Maybe a couple copies of Waboku. Waboku is a great card. It's a great card. Who doesn't run a Waboku? What? Number 54, Lionheart! Is an Earth Warrior with 100 attack and defense, requiring three level ones. His effect is he cannot be destroyed while in face of attack position in battle. And when you take battle damage from battles involving this card, you inflict the same amount of damage to your opponent. Mind you, this is effect damage. And you can detach a material during the damage calculation, so your opponent takes all battle damage you would have taken. Number 54 is one of my personal exceed monsters. His ability to reflect your battle damage that you would have taken is just beautiful, especially if you're up against something like Blue Eyes Chaos Max Dragon or, you know, any big beefy boss monsters. Although, mind you, this effect doesn't work against things like Utopia the Lightning. Although he's still protected from the battle, your opponent won't take any effect damage. And just so you know, yes, I do run this thing in Karibos, because this thing is just the big beefy beat stick of the Karibo deck. So you might want to run at least three of this thing, because to tell you the truth, once your opponent knows you're trying to bring this thing out, they will do whatever is in their power to stop it. They'll solemn strike it, they'll solemn warning it, they'll break the rules and put three copies of solemn judgment into the deck just to prevent you from doing this, so make sure you bring extras. Romping and stomping in, we got number 55, Go, 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 Goliath. An Earth Rock Monster, damn, that's the third one on this list already, with 2400 attack and 1200 defense. He needs two level fours. His effect is that all your monsters gain 800 defense, and you can detach a material, then target a level four Earth Rock Monster in the graveyard and add it to your hand, but you can only use this effect once per turn. So yeah, number 55 is a decent body, although for some reason his effect is geared towards defense, even though go -Go Go's are mostly an offensive-minded lot. His defect, yeah, defect, detach def effect is great, especially if you combine it with something like Go 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 Giant, which will effectively allow you to float into multiple copies of either Go 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 Goliath or into other rank 4 exceed monsters. So if you're going to rank, yeah, put in a rank 4 exceed deck, then this guy's good, you know? Put in two copies of it would be good. Creeping under the floorboards, next up we've got number 56, the Golden Rat. He's a light beast with 500 attack and 600 defense, requiring three level ones. His effect is you can detach a material to draw a card and then return a card from your hand into the deck. Yeah, this guy, this guy seems kind of familiar. Can't quite put my finger on it. Uh, oh yeah, it's literally the same thing as number 10 Aluminum and Niminite, except worse. Getting to draw extra cards is always good in Yu-Gi-Oh, but the fact that you're going to take one of those cards and put it in back into your deck, far, far away from where you need it, is far from ideal. The only thing I can think of where this effect would actually be good, like just off the top of my head, would be if you had like, I don't know, an assault-based deck where you want to put your assault mode monsters back into the deck to summon them out, but that deck wouldn't run level 1 monsters normally, so this card's almost completely useless. And no, you don't put it in Karibo. Don't do it. It's stupid. Seeing into the past, the present, the future, we've got number 57, Tri-Headed Dust Dragon. A fire dragon with 100 attack and 2600 defense, needing 3 level 4s. And when he is special summoned, you can target an opponent's monster and gain attack equal to its current attack. And if the opponent controls more cards than you do, you can detach a material and then choose an unused zone of your opponent's monster spell trap. And while this card's face up, it cannot be used. So number 57's pretty good, because his boost effect works whether he's exceed summoned or special summoned by something like Call of the Haunted, etc. So he's always going to be able to get some decent attack boost unless your monster, opponent's monster can't be targeted. But I really, really want to look at that second effect. If your opponent's got more cards than you, choose an unknown zone and they can't use it. Hmm? Is this... Is this the possible answer to the Link format? Is this the Link Slayer of Legend that we've all desired? 
I mean, look at it. I mean, if your opponent goes first and doesn't summon from the extra deck, you know, they brick, whatever. You summon this thing out. I don't care how you do it. And then you select their extra monster zone, and they can't use it. Or, if they're using Pendulums, you can pick one of the Pendulum zones, which is not part of the Spell and Trap zones, and they can't use that either. This card's great. I'm hoping somebody's going to put some use into this card. It, it needs to. It really needs to. Hugging your face like he just doesn't care, we've got number 58, Burner Visor. A fire pyro monster with a thousand attack and defense, needing two level four monsters. His effect is once per turn, you can either equip this card to a monster of yours, or special summon it to your field in attack mode. And when this card is attached to a monster, then that monster can attack it directly. And when it does, you can detach, discard a card, detach, discard, discard a card to deal 500 damage. I cannot read today, I apologize. So, kind of like number 57, number 58 is one of those interesting Egg Seed monsters that actually does not use its materials to you activate its effects. So, you usually want to run this thing in a deck where you summon a big, beefy monster. You equip number 58 to it and allow your monster to attack the opponent directly. And while doing all this might cost you a bit of resource, if you got a good enough monster on your field, that's not usually a problem. This thing's usually ran in things like Batland boxes, as they can churn this thing out no problems ask. Looking like he just came off of a really, really fun cooking show, we've got number 59, Crooked Cook. A fire warrior with 2300 attack and 200 defense, needing two level 4 monsters. His effect is that while you have no cards, he is unaffected by card effects. You can detach a material during either player's turn to destroy as many other cards you control as possible. And this card gains 300 attack for each card sent to the graveyard to the end phase. So number 59 has a pretty cool effect that makes it work well with lots of cards that have floating effects. But it can run into trouble if your opponent's got just a whole bunch of big monsters. Run this thing with the cards like Artifacts, True Kings, things like that. It's pretty good. I would run probably no more than one. He's pretty much a one-trick pony and a standalone kind of guy. Oh boy, here he is. You've been watching. You've been waiting. It's number 60, Phaser Karibo. Ah! He's a light fiend with 300 attack and 200 defense, requiring two or more level 1 monsters. His effect being that you can attach a material during either player's turn, and all Karibo cards you control are unaffected by the effects of your opponent's cards. And this card gains 400 attack and defense for every Karibo in the graveyard. However, you can only control one number 60 favors of Karibo. So this is it, man. This is the boss monster that the Karibo deck has been looking for. Makes the whole deck super, super viable, especially once we get more support, you know? Just flood the field with Karibos, make them invincible. It's just beautiful, beautiful card. Don't you see it, children? Who cares about Lynx? Who cares about Dracos? Who cares about Spiles? Who cares about any of that shit? The Karibo Revolution is here! Rise, my brothers! Rise from the depths and take them in a storm! <laughs> Next on the list is number 61, a Volcasaurus, a fire dinosaur with 2,500 attack and 1,000 defense, needing two level fives. His effect is that you can detach a material from this card to target a face-up monster of your opponent's, destroy it, and if you do, inflict damage equal to its original attack. However, this card cannot attack directly the turn that this effect is applied. So other than having some very uncomfortable looking thorny knees, number 61 is actually a fairly good card. You know, I mean, it's a bit dated nowadays, but it still can do what it does. This cool destruction burn effect is good for getting rid of a big tricky monster and then inflicting some very serious damage onto your opponent. Although it doesn't work again at cards that can't be targeted, but who cares? So I like it, you know, put it in any deck that can bring out rank 5s easy, like Dynamis, even though you can't pendle them as well as anymore. But yeah, put it in Dynamis, things like that. Blow up your opponent's monsters. I'd run it at 1. It's it, Again, just like number Crooked Cook. Number Crooked Cook. Just like Crooked Cook, he is just a one-trick kind of guy, so just run one of them. Just think of him as the key to open a locked door, and everything will work out just fine. 
coming at us live from out of space. We've got number 62, Galaxy Eyes Prime Photon Dragon. He is a light dragon with 4,000 attack and 3,000 defense, needing two level 8 monsters. His effect being that if he battles during the damage calculation, you can detach material once per battle. And this card gains attack equal to the combined ranks of all the exceed monsters on the field, times 200 during that damage calculation only. If he is destroyed by an effect while Galaxy Eye's Photon Dragon is one of his materials, he is special summoned during the second standby phase afterwards, and his attack is doubled. However, he is, eh, he's, has, has damage is halved. Well, he has no Galaxy Eye's Photon Dragon as a material. So, Galaxy Eye's Prime Photon Dragon has the potential to become an absolutely huge beat stick, if you can last that long. Lasting two turns without your big monster is usually not going to work out too well, especially if your opponent's good at swarming the field. So make sure you got the comeback capabilities if you're going to be running that effect. Number 62 is also great either for or against Exceed Spam. Either you having tons of Exceed monsters and boosting attack to major amounts, or if your opponent's just spamming Exceed monsters and then you summon this thing and run them over. So I think this this is a very passable card, guys. This is a good card. I'd run them at about uh, two, you know, for Galaxy decks. Although, to be honest, in today's game, this guy's this guy's uh, purpose is a bit more out there. But I'll get into that next episode. I'll talk about that again. Next up, looking very, 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 very pissed off, is number 63, Shamoji Soldier. A light fairy with zero attack and 2,000 defense, needing two level ones. His effect is that once per turn, you can detach material to use one of these effects. At the start of your opponent's deck standby phase, both players draw a card, or each player gains 1,000 life points. So I look at Shamoji Soldier and I'm like, okay, what is the point of this card? Is there some deep hidden meaning? Is it, is it possible that Shimoji Soldier is the truth? Is he just here to show us that life doesn't have to be so terrible and shit? We can all get together and sit at the same table, eat meals together and sing songs of joy, and just live life happy and full and free and carefree and all the good shit in the world. Or I'm just going to look at this card and say it's complete garbage and it was from the manga and who the fuck gives a crap. Run this thing only if you really want to or if you really want to give your opponent life points. It's a preference card if there ever was one. Here to fly by the seat of his own pants is number 64, Ronin Raccoon Sandayu. He is an earth beast with a thousand attack and defense, needing two level two beasts to summon. His effect is that you can detach a material to special summon a Kagamusha Raccoon token, and that token's attack becomes equal to the current attack of the monster with the most attack on the field. While, and while you control another beast monster, then Sandayu cannot be destroyed by battle or by card effect. So I remember way, way back when the game was young and Sandaya was actually a pretty relevant card. You know, everyone was running this thing for a little while. So you can imagine the game state was a lot slower back then. The non-targeted attack boost that these tokens gives is actually really good for running out of, eh, running over big problematic boss monsters, even in today's game. So there's really nothing wrong with Sandaya. Plus the fact that they just printed that new Nimble card, uh, Nimble Beaver, was it? Yeah, it's like a Nimble Beaver, so summoning Tandayu is in fact easier now than it ever was before. Make a deck dedicated to summoning Sandayu with lots of level 2 beast monsters, you know, Nimble Momonga, Baby Raccoons, things like that. You have yourself a fun, fun time. Ignoring all of his mother's advice about running with sharp implements, we've got number 65, Gin Buster. A dark fiend with 1300 attack, zero defense, needing two level two dark monsters. And during either player's turn, when an opponent's monster effect is activated, you can detach two materials from this card to negate the activation. And if you do, inflict 500 effect damage. Or you could not be a total scrub and just play Forbidden Chalice. Seriously though, this guy kind of feels like a waste of really cool artwork. Being able to negate your opponent's monster effects is always a disruptive play, but having to bring out an exceed monster just to negate one effect, 
albeit with a little bit of 500 bird damage, this card just feels like unnecessary, really. But there is one use to this guy, which we'll get to in the future. So, for now, put this guy on the afterburners. Here, with the key to your heart, we've got number 66, Master Key Beetle. He's a dark insect with 2,500 attack and 800 defense, needing two level 4 dark monsters. His effect is that once per turn you can detach a material, then target a card you control. While this card's on the field, the targeted card cannot be destroyed by card effects. And if Master Key Beetle would be destroyed, you can send one of the targets to the graveyard instead. So, number 66 is a great first turn option, if nothing else. It protects your strong back row cards from being destroyed by opponents, twin twisters, and the like. And he can even protect himself by sending said cards to the graveyard. And since his targeted effect works on both spells, traps, and monsters, you can even target cards like Sangan or Witch of the Black Forest, whatever you want. So when they get sent to the graveyard, you get to add a card and protect your Master Key Beetle. So yeah, versatility is king here. Run one or two in a dark deck at your preference. Here to lay down the law of the land, we've got number 67, Grand Maester Karibu. A dark fairy with 3,000 attack and 200 defense, needing two level 1 Karibu monsters. His effect is, once per turn, you can detach a material to special summon a Karibu monster from your hand or deck. And all Karibu monsters you control gain 3,000 attack. You can only control one, number 67, Grand Maester Karibo. Okay, I'm going to I'm gonna chill out before, you know, Evil tries to throw another lightning bolt at me. I, mean, I don't, I don't want to char my head again. So, 67's a great search for Karibo. He's even better than the great flute of summons of Karibo. Uh, the fact that all the monsters that you control are going to get 3,000 attack is going to turn all your Karibos into massive beat sticks to beat over that pesky blue eyes white dragon. And being able to combine this with Phaser Karibo, even though it's a bit hard with Lynx, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it it's a little trickier now. But yeah, if you combine this with Phaser, it's just you got an unstoppable board that no one's going to be able to get over. So I'm going to stay with two on Grand Maester Karibo for now, and run three if you're really confident in yourself. High in the sky with the devil in his eye, we've got number 68, Sandafon, the Sky Prison. A dark rock with 2100 attack, 2700 defense, needing two level eights. His effect is that he gains 100 attack and defense for every monster in the graveyard. And you detach a material, and until the end of your opponent's next turn, this card cannot be destroyed by card effects, and the monsters it cannot be special summoned from the graveyard. Due to the chances of your opponent being able to... Yeah, hold on. Seeing as in today's game, all players are just all about filling their graveyards with cards in order to use them again. You know, graveyard activated effects are all the rage these days. Santa Fon is definitely going to become a huge beat stick right out of the bat, potentially gaining 1,000, 1,500 attack easy. His ability to become immune to your opponent's card effects is great, especially seeing as it'll also give him a 100 point boost, as well as preventing your opponent from summoning anything from the graveyard. Granted, I do wish Santa Fon had been Iron Chain support because I love that old archetype and they definitely need some kind of support, you know, get somebody on that. Come on, Konami. I want my Iron Chain support, damn it. Uh, try it out once it comes out in the TCJ. You know, run it at one or two in a rank eight build. It'll work out for you just fine. Being quite as serious as I can be for this next one because honestly, I can make so many jokes right here. We've got number 69, Heraldry Crest, a light psychic monster with 2600 attack and 1400 defense, needing three level 4 monsters. His effect is when he is special summoned, you can negate all other Exceed monsters' effects on the field, and you can target a face of Exceed monster, and until the end phase, this card's name becomes its name, and it gains its effects, but you can only control one number 69, Heraldry Crest. So, yeah, I'm not going to make a 69 joke here, guys. Don't You're going to put your own in the comment section if you feel like it. It's cool that number 69's effect works whether he's Ixseed Summit or not, but it still only works with Ixseed monsters. You can really see this was early Zexal era card. It's also good that this guy's generic, unlike number 8 Genome Heritage, but it's still just great. Or number 8, you know, it's just... You can put in anything you, you want. If you're expecting your opponent to have a lot of Ixseed monsters, just 
put this in a rank four spam, but you know, just don't hold your breath for this thing saving your life. It's coming down to sit down beside her, we've got number 70, Malevolent Sin. A dark insect monster with 2,500 attack and 1,200 defense, needs two level fours. And you can detach a material, then target a monster on the field and banish it until your opponent's next standby phase. And at the end of the damage step, if this card attacks, it gets 300 attack and a rank up by three. The banish effect in number 70 is pretty nice, although, again, it doesn't uh, affect big, big monsters, but it does prevent floating, so it's pretty good. And, you know, insects don't have a lot of extra deck monsters anyway, so this is a nice addition to that. The attack boost is, you know, it's mediocre, but it's okay. And as for the ranking up, just attacking once will turn this guy into a rank 7. I mean, you can use Exceeds Burst to destroy our opponent's back row. And if you do it twice, well, that goes with a monster that we're going to talk about later. He fits right snugly in a trio of cards I just simply adore. Man, oh man, you know, Shark Archetype really just blows my mind. It's like every time we talk about them, there's just nothing bad about them. They're just great, great gods. You can just tell that the Zexal staff really pulled no punches when they were making that deck. So, yeah, we've got another member of the Shark Archetype. So, everyone, please give a round of applause for number 71, Rebarian Shark. So this guy's a water dragon with a zero attack, 2,000 defense, needing two level three monsters. It's a fact being that he can target a number in the graveyard, except to himself, special summon it, and attach a material to that monster, former Barbarian Shark. And when he's sent to the graveyard, you can target a rank up spell card in your deck and place it on top of the deck. Barbarian Shark's just beautifully synergetic with all number monsters. You can put him in pretty much any deck that uses numbers. But let's look at that second part, because that's really the meat on the bone here. So I wasn't going to talk about rank up spells until the last episode of this, but I'm going to just briefly touch up on number support extraordinaire, rank up magic of the seventh one. The spell allows you basically to take a number and then special summon it from the extra deck and then bring out another number that's a bigger version of itself and then summon it on top of that using it as a material. The only downside to Rank Up Magic 7th one is that the only way to activate it is if you draw it during your normal draw phase. So if you draw it the first turn, it's totally useless. But that whole problem is completely circumvented by number 71. So here's the thing, take a shark deck, run three of this thing, you know you want to. Here to say game on, we've got number 72, Shogi Rook. An Earth Beast Warrior with 2,500 attack and 1,200 defense, needing two level sixes. His effect is at one per turn. You can detach two materials, target a face-up monster, your opponent controls, and a face-up spell trap, and destroy them. But battle damage your opponent takes is halved for the rest of the turn to use his effect. So basically, this guy's a worse Gizaris. The specific situation needed to activate this effect, being that your opponent has to have a face-up monster and a face-up spell trap, means that you're not going to be able to use Shogi Rook's effect all that often. And even under the circumstance in which you do use it, the battle damage that your opponent takes is halved, so basically Shogi Rook is next to useless. So, yeah, I'm sorry Shogi Rook, your time, if it ever happened, is long, long past, so get the fuck out of here. Here to cannonball right into the TCG, we've got number 73, Abyss Splash. He's a water warrior with 2400 attack and 1400 defense, needing two level 5 water monsters. And during either player's turn, you can detach a material to double his attack, but your opponent takes half damage till the end of the turn. The fact that Abyss Splash has a built in limiter removal effect is kind of cool. But the fact that the damage is halved makes it less cool. Although, I'm taking the way from this thing. Abyss Splash is great for running over your bo opponent's big boss monsters, so it's not bad. He is kind of a shark. He's not a shark, but he goes in the shark deck. It's, it's a weird thing they got going. So, yeah, you can put him with sharks, and they can certainly bring it out. They got level fives they can do. They got panther shark. They got leopard shark. They got shark shark. So, run it if you want to. Next up, we got number 74, a Master of Blades. An Earth Psych... No, no, I'm sorry, guys, hold on, I gotta do this one over again. This is the entirely inappropriate voice for this. Hold on a second. Whoa. Next, we have number 74, Master of Blades. 
An Earth Psychic Monster. <laughs> uh, okay, enough of that. An Earth Psychic Monster with 2,700 attack, 2,300 defense. Needs two level 7s. His effect being during either player's turn, when a card or effect is activated that targets this card, you can detach a material to negate the activation and destroy it, and then destroy it on a card your opponent controls. So it, it's kind of weird that this guy's a psychic monster, because you know, he, he looks like something out of Arabian Nights. Is this an Assassin's Creed reference? I'm going to call this an Assassin's Creed reference. Uh, though, I do like this effect to protect him from targeted effects. You know, it lets you negate the effect, and it lets you pop a card to your opponent. So, you know, your opponent won't be able to target it unless they're complete morons. He's got a decent stat line, so that's not bad. So, you know, if you can make a level 7 monster, go ahead. Although, personally, I'm going to prefer bringing out number 7 Lucky Straight. But this guy could be a decent second to that if that doesn't work out. And finally, we've got number 75, the Gambler of Souls. He's a light spellcaster with 2,500 attack and 2,000 defense. Needs two level 7s. And his effect is, once per turn, you can detach one material from this card, roll a six-sided die, and toss a coin, and apply the appropriate effect. If you get a heads and an even number, you banish all other cards on the field. Heads and an odd number, you banish all cards in your opponent's graveyard. Tails in an even number, you banish all the cards in your graveyard. Tails in an odd number, you banish all the cards in your graveyard, on your field, and in your hand, and you take 6,000 points of damage. Now, as I've mentioned before, I'm an absolute sucker for gamble cards, and no other gamble card does the same as number 75, both a coin toss and dice roll. The first two effects could just absolutely devastate your opponent, as being able to nuke every kind of card or nuke your opponent's graveyard is just total, total disruption. The third effect, you know, it depends on what kind of build you're doing. If you rely on the graveyard, I wouldn't recommend running this guy because you can completely screw yourself up. And if you get the fourth effect, you're going to destroy yourself and you are going to cry like a little bad bird. Thank you, everybody, for sticking through yet another episode of Numerology. I think we had some fun with this one. I know I flopped a few lines, but, you know, I, my tongue is just on a, it's on a rebellion, I'm telling you. It's a huge revolution all up in my mouth here. So, now that we're at episode three of this... I think it's finally time to ask this one. If you guys enjoy this little series I'm doing, you enjoy it, you enjoy the crazy stuff that I do, consider subscribing. You know, that'd be pretty cool. I, it, I'd appreciate it. I really would. The next episode, we're going to wrap things up with numbers 76 through 100. So we got three more numbers to make, and I'm thinking something along the lines of a snap, crackle, pop kind of theme. You know, I don't know. What do you guys think? That's absolutely the dumbest thing you've ever said in your entire life. <laughs>I mean, yeah, that probably would work so long as you don't take it, like, literally with the whole snap, crackle, pop thing. <laughs> well, thank, thanks, you guys. You, you're just the best at guys ever. <laughs> but anyway, thanks again for staying. Now, to show off my didgeridoo skills once again. <gasps>